testing? Yeah, okay. Um, good evening, everyone, and thank you for braving the um, dark and stormy night. <laughs> but it's not snow, so that's the good news. Um, we had to cancel once one year, and that's not fun. So anyway, um, let's see. I have cheat sheet here. Um, uh, first thing on my list is that this is going to be an interactive presentation rather than a uh, slide presentation. So we do tape. Um, these do go on our website, our videotaped programs. So if there's a reason that you don't want to appear, uh, please let us know so we can not uh, focus the camera on you. If you ask a question, most likely you might appear. Uh, more than the back of your head. So that's the first thing. Um, I'm Helen Wilson, uh, Vice President of the Squirrel Hill Historical Society, and our president is still on vacation, and he's due back for the next meeting, so um, um, he will be back. Um, our other board members that are here are Betty Connolly, who is our, the, our, my co-vice president uh, right there. And I thought I saw Toby, yeah, Toby Chapman is on the board. Audrey Glickman, who is running our, um, the videotaping. And I think that's all. Wayne's not here. And Wayne is the guy who, if you looked at, if you're a member and you looked at the newsletter, wrote the article about the mob. And, um, <laughs> yeah, it was a good article. But if you notice in, in the article, he said he had a hard time um, getting people to write things down because they don't, want, they don't want to be quoted. So anyway, but that just brings me to the newsletter. Um, the meetings are free. I did mention last time, and I'll mention again, that if, you're, if you become a member, we have a monthly eight-page newsletter that is more research-based than these meetings, which, are, which cover every topic under the sun. So, um, um, and we're just preparing the March newsletter now, but each one has articles by, um, um, by Wayne, by me, and by anyone who wants to contribute. So that is, the, the contributions can be given to us, your stories of Squirrel Hill, um, reminiscences, I pronounced that right. Um, but anyway, feel free to contribute articles. Um, let's see. This is the end of our membership drive because our, um, our membership year runs from January the 1st through December 31st. So if you, uh, if you want to become a member, this is a good time because then you get the full year's worth of, um, of, of, me of um, um, not membership, news, newsletters, sorry, I did a brain freeze there, of newsletters and um, other kinds of notifications. So, um, upcoming lectures next month is going to prepare us for spring with a talk on Kennywood Park and um, their fantastic new roller coaster that's going up. I don't know if you've seen it. Um, you can't miss it. It's way up over the horizon. Now, um, in the back table we have our books for sale. Um, $20 a piece, and we also have a book that was written by one of our members about the petroleum industry in Pittsburgh, and we're not selling it. I did bring our archive copy to anybody who's interested in looking at it, and there's order forms that you would order directly from the author, who is a member, Al Mann. Um, he's also very involved with the East Liberty Historical Society. So, um, let's see. How about your book, Ann? Is it still available? Our book? Your book. Um, yes, the, well, um, that there's the Squirrel Hill book. I don't have any copies of the Bridge book that my son and I wrote, but the Squirrel Hill um, book of, um, they, Squirrel Hill and Neighborhood History is back there, yes. Um, okay, that's all the announcements. And I'd like to introduce um, Minna, Minna um, Levinson. And um, I don't know if, if you get Shady Ave magazine, but this uh, article, Dragon on the Hill, has a picture of Minna right there on the, front, on the first page. And I just want to read <coughs> a little 
paragraph about her. She's quoted extensively. Um, There's an underlying gut expectation that people care, Levinson explains. Even when adults and adolescents butt heads, the students will know that we care. Put that together with a focus on education, and you get solid results. And that's what she said about Alderdice. And um, as far as her biography, she was born and raised in Pittsburgh, in Squirrel Hill, graduated from Colfax and then Alderdice. She holds degrees from the University of Pittsburgh and the Universidad de Salamanca. She's taught physical education and Spanish in the Pittsburgh public schools since January of 1974. And she's also presented papers at local, state, national, and inter international conferences. So, Mena? It's your turn. Please welcome her. Do I need this? Yes. yes. <laughs> well, first of all, um, thank you. I Okay. I, have to use, I have to use this? Yes, yes you have to. do my phys ed scream across the gym voice, but okay. Um, first of all, very kind of you to uh, uh, have me here this evening. I recognize some faces and uh, former classmates and colleagues and parents. Uh, <laughs> so, um, Dr. James McCoy, who is the principal at Alderdice, had uh, said to me, uh, well, uh, Scroll Hill Historical Society called, and they'd like somebody from school to go speak. Would you do it? I'm like, okay. Um, little did I know that so many people would be here. Um, I'm, I'm, I tend not to be a very, um, what's the best way to say it, uh, pretty down to earth. And so, Rather than sitting here and talking at you all night, uh, I'm going to do some brief uh, summaries, a little bit of history, uh, a couple of points that are personal to me, and then I'm sure that you have lots and lots and lots of questions. But to start off, somehow, uh, Viva La Carnegie Library when they have their, their sales and they uh, try to delete books from their, uh, from their shelves, and they sell these. And I, I found this, it's from Pittsburgh. <coughs> it is the souvenir of the 134th General Meeting of the American Institute of Mining and Metallurgical Engineers, October 5th to 9th, 1926. What does this have to do with Alderdice? <coughs> Anybody? Go. Alderdice was in the process of being built when this meeting took place. And let me bring it up here. Part of this uh, relates to educational facilities. Although Pittsburgh is well supplied with educational facilities of a high standard, there is a constant need for more and additional schools and colleges which are under construction and are projected. The Pittsburgh Board of Education, I'm sorry, the Board of Public Education, has supplied the following information regarding the Pittsburgh Public Schools. So, again, October 1926. The school property of the city of Pittsburgh is valued at uh, $34,202,799. It consists of 145 school buildings with school grounds covering a total area of 7,124,429 square feet and a net yard area of 4,695,219 square feet. The school rooms have sittings for approximately 104,500 pupils and provide almost a seat for every child admitted to the schools. 
Oh. <laughs> Who was standing up? <laughs> and they have a picture of Greenfield Elementary School, which has absolutely nothing around it. They have a picture of Oliver High School. The equipment within the school buildings is such as to afford every pupil of the proper age, I don't know what happened, what's your proper age, I don't know, and grade, the opportunity for a fundamental training in elementary and high school studies, together with free textbooks and supplies. And for such additional or special training in industrial, technical, vocational, or cultural lines as individual tastes may demand, or the needs of the individual in the community may develop. And they show a picture of Westinghouse High School with nothing around it. The total number of pupils in the Pittsburgh Public Schools is 105,449. Of this number, 20,142 are in the junior and senior high schools. Do you remember when they had junior high? Yeah, okay. 10,083 attended evening classes. The high school enrollment has increased 343% during the last 13 years. The Board of Public Education employed 4,208 persons during the last year, distributed as following. I found this really amusing. I'm sorry. Clerks. 100, clerks to the principals, 101. Kindergarten teachers and assistants, 166. Elementary grade teachers, uh, 1,734. Principals, supervisors, and special elementary teachers, 282. Uh, let's see. High school teachers, 620. <coughs> High school principals and special teachers, 294. And as you keep going down, the superintendent and associates were five. Uh, and the janitors, so go back, you had 620 high school teachers and 1,734 elementary teachers. And there were 696 janitors. <laughs> I just found that interesting, interesting in the focus on the upkeep of these schools. Yeah. And then they have a picture of Shenley High School with nothing around it. Okay. And Langley High School with nothing around, around it. Okay. Since the organization of the Pitt's present Board of Public Education in 1911, more than $17 million, now this is almost 100 years ago, $17 million has been spent in the acquisition of sites and the erection of new buildings and additions to older buildings. Among the many large and modern high schools erected may be mentioned the, Shen, the Shenley, the South Hills, the Langley, Oliver, Westinghouse, and additions to South Fifth Avenue and Peabody schools. Among the elementary schools erected, the Greenfield, Chatham, Dilworth, and Boggs Avenue are worthy of mention. Under construction at present, are the Taylor Alderdice High School, a combined junior and senior school to serve the Squirrel Hill District with an ultimate capacity of 3,000. Now, I don't know um, if you remember, when I was in school, we had 3,400 students and we were on three shifts because you couldn't stick them anywhere else. We had 4,100. You had 41, okay. Um, I, unfortunately, the, uh, there's no way to put this up on a screen, even if I had done it prior, but there's a picture of Taylor Alderdice High School as in August of 1926. Um, I'd be happy to pass this around for you to take a look. It is on page 11. The picture of the Taylor Alderdice High School taken in August 14, 1926, clearly shows the class of construction, steel frame and concrete, tile floors and walls, and brick walls, which still stand today. So let, let me 
go back a minute um, to my recollections and my history and relationship to Alderdice. My father's family moved back to Pittsburgh. Uh, they, had, for some reason, got off to California because my grandfather believed that both my father and my uncle would be better served in the Pittsburgh public schools rather than the schools available in California. My mother was a graduate of Alderdice, as was my uncle, as was just about everybody else in my family. And the expectation was very simple. You go to Alderdice, you study, and you move on. Now, my mother spoke many times of the uh, business option. So over the years, you could do a, an academic, you could do a vocational, or you could do a business diploma. Nowadays, move forward, everybody has an academic diploma. That's interesting. Um, and some people have the designation of CAS, Center for Advanced Studies, which originally started in... Hmm, before it was CAS, it was the Pittsburgh Scholars Program. How many of you remember the Pittsburgh Scholars Program? And, and are, were graduates of that. Yeah. And it was an opportunity um, to address the needs of the students. So, again, both of my parents, my whole family, literally my whole family, has graduated from Walter Dice. And thank God it's gone on to do very well. I will go back to my own days as a um, little child, although I don't know that I was ever little. And I started at Colfax in kindergarten, uh, and my maiden name was Altshuler. Uh, but by my birth date, I was uh, Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday afternoon kindergarten because Friday afternoons we didn't have class because the teachers went and did home visits. Do you remember home visits? Yeah. Okay. So it was very important. I, I can't imagine them doing that now. But, so we only had four days and the students that were born in the, uh, in the first half of the year uh, had five days. They had, it was a half day kindergarten. You either went morning, you went afternoon, and uh, went from there. And then came grade one, and one day I, uh, I had no clue. My mother obviously had been in contact with uh, Dr. Prekler. Is that a, a name from the past? Okay. And Dr. Pregler, and uh, one day Dr. Pregler pulled me into her office and asked me a lot of questions. I answered them, and I went back to class. Um, I had to laugh. My brother somehow got called into speech classes. So as soon as I came into grade one, first day, they pulled me into speech class. I drew pictures. I never went back. I don't know. I'm not sure what they did or what their purpose. Anyway, so two months later, Dr. Prager came back and said to me, how would you like to visit the workshop? Okay. I was five. I, I, I had no clue. Fine. Now, with all, all joking aside, does anybody know what the basis of the workshop was? Evidently, they, the, all the questions were a form of a, an IQ test. And so what they did is they took students and put them in for the morning. So we had reading, um, some history, some other aspects. And we were together in one room in the morning. And then in the afternoon, we, we milled back into our groups for uh, math and science. Um, it was interesting. Frankly, I, I, I think I was the stupidest one in the bunch. Um, people went on to just, they were brilliant, absolutely brilliant people. Um, but I went back and I did some research. And in the 1940s, uh, Dr. Pregler was interviewed by the Pittsburgh Post-Gazette, I believe it was. And in the article, she made a very clear point, is that each student has a different need. And that gifted students needed a special series of trainings. 
However, along with that training, they had the moral and civic obligation to give back to the community. And that was the basis of, uh, of her forming the workshop. And, uh, you know, in, at the time, I, I, I never thought of it. Okay, you're here, I'm here, fine, I do this. You know, and again, I started when I was five. I, really, very, very uh, unsavvy of the world. But now when I go back and I read this article, and the focus that she had, um, there was a lot of controversy at the time about Colfax, <coughs> about, about the workshop. Uh, because many parents felt that it was elitist. And I can understand that. I can also understand from having taught lots of different kids over the years, again, each student has a different set of needs. And it is our moral and pedagogic uh, obligation to do the best we possibly can to meet the needs of each student. Without, without any kind of um, um, preconceived ideas. And so, so to, from what I experienced then, and then moving on to Alderdice, when they established the uh, Pittsburgh Scholars Program, and I'm not sure what the criteria were for entering the Pittsburgh Scholars Program, uh, but, uh, it really, it really, really hit home once I started reading these articles uh, of Dr. Pregler. Um, you know, I agree and disagree with some of the things, but it really made sense. So, I've now come to Alderdice. Well, I haven't gotten there yet. In grade six, on the last day of school, Dr. Pregler called the entire sixth grade class to the auditorium. And we all expected, hello, you know, congratulations. And she said, well, we're meeting here today to let you know that you're staying at Colfax for another year. <laughs> to which everybody went rather crazy. Um, and if you remember with Alderdice, there were some schools and some students that started in grade seven. It depended, it depended which feeder school you were coming from. By the way, do you remember Davis School? Everybody remember Dave? Okay. So Davis School was grades kindergarten one, two, and three, and then they came to Colfax. And and so there was always been this kind of scaffolding. Alderdice started at grade seven. Some of the students started at grade seven. Uh, some of the students eventually came in at grade eight. Some of the students came in grade nine. And some of the students came in from Mifflin in grade ten. And they started bringing over the Pittsburgh Scholars Program students from Westinghouse, and they moved them to Alderdice. So they moved them out of Ald uh, Westinghouse into Alderdice High School. Alderdice, uh, for me, has been very good. Uh, no place is perfect. There are a lot of, uh, it's the good, the, uh, when people come to the school and they say, well, you know, tell us about Alderdice. And I say, well, it's everything you ever wanted, and everything you never wanted, and everything in between. <laughs> and they look at me, and that, frankly, is the truth. Because Alderdice is so diverse, it has so many opportunities, and truthfully, good, bad, and ugly, uh, <laughs> that, that anybody can find anything they want at Alderdice High School. As a student, and uh, in the days when we had uh, 34, 36 people in a class, uh, we had um, gym classes were huge. I think uh, our class had um, our class had 20 people in it, and the other class had 120. So they just split us up, and we we had 77. The days were the days were swimming. Uh, all girls had to wear bathing caps. And, um, and the schools provided the bathing suits. How many, how many of you uh, have one of those? Uh, yeah? Okay. Uh, ladies, um, 
nylon was not uh, was not a component of the suit. They were 100% cotton. So everybody got them two sizes too small because we all had to go through the shower. So as soon as we went, as as we went through the shower, everything just you know fell right down to the hips. Um, and um, you know, and <laughs> but there was a pool. We had swimming. Colfax had a pool. We had swimming. Now, how many public schools in elementary and high school in that time, and even, even now, there's schools around, there are high schools around in the suburbs that don't have a pool. So here we are in the Pittsburgh public schools. Yeah, the bathing suits were silly, and no, you couldn't bring one from home. Um, and yes, we had you know different colored bathing caps depending upon where we were situated in the pool. If we were non-swimmers, shallow water swimmers, deep water swimmers. And then came the moment when the 60s hit and the boys started wearing their hair long. And the girls said, why aren't they wearing caps? So what happened? Nobody wore a cap. Okay. And the whole purpose for wearing a bathing cap was to keep the hair out of the filters to try to maintain the pools properly. So at that point, nobody, nobody wore a cap. And one day, again, as a rather naive ninth grader, and I went and Miss Yoey handed me a bathing suit and said, here, go take this to Mrs. DeLuca and show it to her. Okay. I showed it to Mrs. DeLuca and she lost it. She started screaming out, what did you do? What do you mean? You brought a bathing suit from home and you go back to Miss Yoey and you get... Okay. We'll go back to Miss Yoey. Mrs. DeLuca did not like the bathing suit. She gave me a blue one. I went back and I said to her, I said, Miss Yoey gave it to me. Miss Yoey, I thought you brought it from home. No. <laughs> I didn't bring it. Let me just tell you it is 100% cotton. It is an ugly green, not blue. It has holes in it. Uh, it has no shape. And, and I can't imagine that anybody, any parent would allow any child to buy that, let alone bring it into the building. So, all right, so now we're in ninth grade, we've got this, and we go on. Older Dice was really um, ahead of its time in a lot of ways. Um, how many of you, if you don't want to raise your hand, how many of you remember the riots of the 60s? Okay. And in my senior year, uh, I was in a class where we were 50% white and 50%, as we called it at the time, black. And we were the first African-American history class in the city of Pittsburgh. Now, the class was really unusual because the teacher, uh, Keller Gaither, was somebody who really walked the walk. A uh, very slim African-American gentleman who worked his way up from nothing. He worked on the docks. He worked menial labor. He became educated. He became a teacher. He eventually went on to administration. And here we were in the middle of people running through the halls, literally running through the halls, and the angst and the anger of that era. And we were having an African-American history class with great debate as to right, civil rights and history. He started the class beginning with Gunnar Meyerdahl and did it in a sociologic manner and taught sociology and history all the way through to the modern day. And we had many, many very, very difficult discussions. But he had gravitas, and he had the experience. And so regardless of the feelings of any one person in the class, there was an innate respect for a man who had worked his way up, and he walked the walk. Why do I take the time to point this out? Among the faculty, and the faculty has changed and over the years, and again, I see a couple people here who were on the faculty at Alderdice. The 
there were some teachers who perhaps would have been better served to find another line of work. But there were many, many, many teachers who were superb. And one of the component parts, from my perspective, is that there were a number of teachers who were teaching in the building to avoid the Vietnam War. Mm -hmm. They were quite brilliant, and they were quite dedicated. And there, I can tell you that even now, there is a different milieu. There's a different sense of Alderdice and what is expected and what one should do at Alderdice <clears throat> compared to many, many other places. Even now, I have students who come in and they transfer to Alderdice in grade nine. It's just different. And they, I mean, they, they work their way, they, they, they adjust to the school and to the mentality, but the importance of education, how a student prepares, how a teacher interconnects uh, with the student <coughs> is huge. We had gone through a middle states evaluation, if you're all the accreditation uh, unit. And the head of the visiting team was a principal from the Philadelphia area. And we were sitting, and she was going through all the documentation. And then there was a listing of all of the clubs and all of the activities that Alderdice provided. And she said, well, how much do you get paid? And we stopped, and we looked, and we said, no. These are all volunteer positions. You know, if a student wants to start a club, there's an organization, their team. The team, the team coaches are paid. Uh, although at the time, uh, I think I, I earned 23 cents a, an hour for being a volleyball coach. <laughs> but but she, was, she was floored. And she was floored because in this massive list of activities that were supported by teachers and administrators and other people in the building, Everybody did it because that's what you do. And that's what should be done. So let me just come back to now. Um, obviously, there have been a lot of changes. There have been a lot of physical changes in the plant. I dearly miss the front lawn. Um, you know, what can I tell you? Something majestic of standing down on Shady Avenue and looking up to the, to the uh, uh, neo-Greek uh, pillars. Uh, but, in synopsis, the cafeteria is no longer on the fourth floor, it's on the first floor. Which makes sense, because every time the elevator broke, they couldn't get any food up or down. <laughs> the kitchen of the cafeteria is now the, where the swimming pool was, and the physical education locker rooms on the first floor, uh, including the women's offices, are now the cafeteria. The library in the middle of the third floor main uh, is now a computer room. And the two rooms behind it, uh, there's a classroom and is the Chinese room. The library now takes up the entire second half of the second floor annex. So the lot lost tons of uh, classrooms for that. Uh, of course, the, the three gymnasiums um, have now been torn down, and those are now the um, electric shop. It's not electric shop. It's uh, they're the um, the pre-engineering, the pre-engineering units. So there's electrical, um, physical. There's also the uh, uh, creative arts. Uh, what used to be print shop, which is now computerized uh, uh, design. And so those are now there where, that, where, the, um, uh, where the gyms were. Where the cafeteria was on the fourth floor are now a series of biology classrooms. Uh, and past that, not much else. So the building has morphed. We've lost students with the population. We've lost classroom space because of the need for computer rooms and some other uh, more up-to-date uh, uh, areas. 
But the bottom line is, Alder Dice is bursting at the seams. People are still trying to come into Alder Dice. It's amazing what they do to get there. The good, the bad, and the ugly. And I sent my own children there. If they were of high school age today, I would still send them there. I'm going to stop here. I know I've sort of taken you through a rather uh, convoluted uh, uh, set of decades. But let me start with any questions that you might have. Oh, by the way, there was a question before. Um, the last, the last, you know, they used to have a January graduation and a December. And as much as I could tell from the yearbooks, the last January graduation was in January of 1974. 1964. Sorry, 1964. 110 of us. There you go. Okay. So, all right. Let's do some questions and go. Uh, just to add something, the uh, Sen High School in Chicago is exactly the same, same our architecture, everything as the, well, Alderdice before the additions. Oh, where, where in Chicago is it? North side. Okay. Wow. And it had basically the same population when at that time. We were there. It, was, it must have been. It's the, exact, uh, it's the exact same architecture. I found that out when I went to an open house at Alderdice uh, for my first child. And a friend of mine from Chicago said, I have no trouble going around this school. I went to send. This is the same. So the next time we went to Chicago, we looked. And sure enough, it's just not on a hill. So you don't notice it right away. But if you look carefully, it is the same school. OK. Let's go. Yes, sir. Was the annex original to the building, or was that built later? No, the, uh, it was built very shortly after. Um, the main was built, and to my recollection, within a year or two, they recognized that it wasn't going to work, and they immediately built the annex. And you still cannot go from the first floor main to the first floor annex. <laughs> yeah, and uh, no students, and, and, oh, I'm sorry. You don't go out to smoke at the wall. <laughs> yeah. What is that thing at the base of the hill and going up the slope? I mean, in, that's taken away your lawn. Uh, the gymnasium and the swimming pool. Um, the swimming pool. The one thing very interesting. One thing very. Um, one thing very interesting on the on the wall of the swimming pool, the new swimming pool, is a mosaic dragon. So that's uh, it's it's really neat. But I tell you, as, a, as having taught swimming in there, uh, the acoustics are horrific. And uh, all, one person has to talk, and it just resounds through the whole place. Yeah? Where was Colfax at? Exactly where it is. I don't know. What oh, I'm sorry. What I mean. oh, okay. Um, all right, so let's see if I can do this. Here's Shady Avenue. Okay. Do you know where the Politzetic Synagogue is? Yes. Okay. Uh, when you get to Politzetic, you make a right onto Phillips, and at the end of the block, right across the street is Colfax. Which, by the way, they took, um, they took uh, most of the field away and added on an addition because Colfax is now bursting at the seams as well. Mm. I think we have about, uh, we run between 1,400 and 1,500 students. And uh, Alderdice currently has, um, has the regular program, uh, the CS program, APs. Uh, Ted Fenton, by the way, started the APs locally with a history class. Ted Fenton was a professor at Carnegie Mellon. Um, so he began that. Uh, then um, we have now something that didn't ha have before. We've always had special education, or as they say, uh, classes for students with special needs. They now have autistic classrooms. There are two classrooms. Ah, that's the other thing. The orchestra room is no longer. It's down um, in the back uh, of the building. And the choir room, which had a magnificent series of risers that were solid wood, 
Well, that's not there. So they're down, uh, they're down near the shops. Do you remember where the shops are? Yeah. Yeah. Okay, and yeah. sort of the Nicholson side. So they're down there, and they now have, they now have classrooms. I believe there are one or two classrooms for autistic students. They have, we now have classrooms for English as a second language. We've taken on a number of uh, immigrants, and it is illegal for anybody to ask whether or not somebody has a passport or green card. So any student that walks in the door and shows two forms of um, an electric bill, two forms of residence, can come in at any time, doesn't any time, they come in, they start, period. And um, so there are English as a second language classrooms now. We've had students uh, for, there was one wave where we had a lot of the, um, I want to say Sudanese, but no, the Somali. We had some, uh, a group of Somali. Right now, most of the English as second language classes uh, are filled with Middle Eastern students, um, many, many Guatemalans. And very interestingly, uh, a student just enrolled, he came into my class, his family is from Venezuela. Mm. So uh, right now with everything uh, surprising they got out, I'm not quite sure how they arranged it, but with uh, Maduro and uh, uh, the, the runaway inflation and no medicine and no food, all of the, the educated people are fleeing. Uh, this has been getting worse over the last 10 years. So we have now classes for the ESL students. We have classes for the, uh, what we used to call socially and emotionally, we have classes for special needs. Um, there are students with Down syndrome, um, lower development. So any, Alderdice has the capacity to serve just about any student and of any population, which <coughs> correlates back with the original um, statement in that metallurgic book that the Pittsburgh Public Schools is here to teach every single student. Let's be realistic. Are there students that have issues and are not properly served? Of course. Um, you know, I'm not going to paint a, that, that this is the be all end all, but what I will tell you is very simply, the dedication of the faculty, the opportunities available in a public setting have been crucial to the development, maintenance of the middle class, and many, many, many of the educational achievements and advances. And Alderdice, for all its good, bad, and, and, and ugly, Alderdice really continues to serve this community in a magnificent, very, very, very solid manner. Yes. So. All the dice has an official catchment area, and then the people try and get in by fair means and foul or from other districts? Other feeder patterns. Ah. Uh, Alder dice feeder pattern comes in from the basic feeder pattern would be Greenfield, Hazelwood, uh, Homewood, parts of Homewood, Shadyside, which is new, which came in a few years ago. Uh, Shady site used to go to what was Peabody, what is now Obama. So they come, Shady Side, obviously all of Squirrel Hill, Lincoln Place, West Homestead, um, and um, right over the hill, uh, Swiss Elm Park. Swiss Elm Park, okay. Um, but for the students who are in the engi pre engineering, those students can come in from anywhere in the city. There's some students that take a couple of buses. Um, and so sometimes what you have, you know, if a one parent lives in one place and one parent, or there's a, you know, the reality is that um, that's, this student automatically lives in Scroll Hill or lives in the feeder pattern. I see, yeah, go. I'm just curious, I do, uh, I mean, co-chair the Princeton alumni energies here. Mm -hmm. And we see tremendous students from Squirrel Hill or Point Breeze at 
Obama, Kappa, and Psi Tech. Mm -hmm. And I'm curious that have the magnets somehow weakened Aldrich, particularly with the arts? I know that, in a sense, Aldrich is sort of a STEM school, frankly, right? with the arts very underdeveloped. Are you losing good students with magnets? Absolutely. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. Um, there are students, and that goes both ways. There are students that have gone to Kappa, which is the Center uh, for the Arts and Performing Arts, um, who have gone and come back um, because they didn't feel the academics were rigorous enough. There are students who are at Obama, which is the um, International Baccalaureate. So if you go to the, you know, they pulled them off. The SciTech, what used to be Frick, in Oakland, right across from Ajax, Babo, and Comet. Ring any bells? Do you, do you remember that? Okay. Um, Pitt, University of Pittsburgh built three round dormitories, and they, when they were built, they were referred to as Ajax, Babo, and Comet. Um, and right across the street was is Frick School, which originated as a teacher's, teacher's training school, then was a local K to six school, which I can remember having substituted there when I was a uh, newbie out of university, and uh, it was a challenge. Um, and then it became the, uh, the school for foreign languages, the middle school, that was supposed to be moving to the uh, International Baccalaureate School. Um, and now it is Science and Technology Institute. So they're more selective. Uh, the truth of the matter is, they're the science students in our building, off, really. Um, and, and what our students are doing is really phenomenal. Really, I, I have no question. So the, answer, the short answer to the question is yes. Um, and that's just the way it is. And it was done, that was the magnets. Are you all uh, familiar with the magnet schools? Anyone? Um, there's a, an art school, <coughs> International Baccalaureate, Science and Tech. There's um, a cosmetology school they, I believe, held at Westinghouse. But the underlying purpose for these magnet schools was for integration. And, uh, and so, yeah, we have lost people. Yes? I have a story for you. Please. Um, we Want moved to... No, I, st I speak loud. Uh, we moved to, uh, to uh, Pittsburgh from Philadelphia in 1955. I had finished medical school and uh, came out here for a residency in psychiatry. Uh, before, naturally, before we, we moved, uh, we, we went to my parents' home. They were still they they wouldn't move from Philadelphia, and they said, "Well, you got to talk to your next door neighbor. He's from Pittsburgh, and he can tell you all about Pittsburgh." So we went in to see him. Very nice. We talked for a while, and he said, "You're gonna have kids, right?" I said yes. He said, "Well, here's what you do. When you go to Pittsburgh, you go to uh, uh, Forbes and Shady." And you go into the drugstore there, and in the drugstore there is a man who will help you find the right kind of place to live in the area called Squirrel Hill. And one of the pharmacists there was, uh, uh, she was a pharmacist there, but she was a chemistry teacher. Yeah, right, okay. And so, uh, so we got there, and... Uh, we, we talked about it, and he said, look, he said, we got to find a good place where you're going to want to have children, and you're going to want to have make sure that your children go to school in Squirrel Hill, because the high school is really special. We heard about this, you know, our, our one child was one year old, uh, and, <laughs> <laughs> and so uh, I've lived in Squirrel Hill, uh, since that time, our children, in fact, all went to Alderdice, 
And the, the remarkable thing about Alderdice for, for us has been our three children were very, very different from each other. Uh, and despite the differences, they all found something at, uh, uh, that, for the, that was perfect for them when they got to high school. Uh, uh, and uh, they used to talk about this. Uh, and the, and the, in fact, my middle son always used to say that he he did, he went to a different school from his brother and sister, <laughs> and yet it fit them all. It, they, they, each one of them found a fit that was just perfect for their their temperament, for their intellectual abilities, for their interest systems, and so forth. So it, uh, it's pretty remarkable. Sure. Yes. I, no, so I just wanted to mention that um, uh, in preparation for your talk, I started to look on a website called dawnslist.net, which has all the Alderdice yearbooks, and I was looking through them, so it's really interesting. So dawnslist, one word, dot net. I just thought I'd mention it. I graduated in 1970, so when you go through the yearbooks, the one yearbook will stand out to you very clearly. Mm -hmm. And that's because our yearbook was red with black lettering, which, of course, was Shenley's colors. <laughs> and, and, well, why, why was the 1970 Alderdice yearbook red? Well, we were all very individualistic. I don't know if Sherry covered. And there were older, there were six hundred and six there were six I'm sorry there were six hundred and sixty seven one sixty seven somewhere in there uh, in our graduating class and the the um, the prom was almost canceled because with between uh, students and their dates there were one hundred and ninety eight people where was everybody well it was the sixties where did we go we all went to anti-proms, and we all went to, you know, and they did have the prom, it was fine, they got some more people, but we were all, we all went to anti-proms, you know, and, uh, and, and I remember there was um, a reformed Jew, a conservative Jew, an African American, a Methodist, a Catholic, who then went on to become Buddhist, I think, um, I don't know, and we all went to his house, and we ate, pretzels and you drank Coca-Cola and um, listened to Tom Lehrer's Vatican Rat. Um, so, you know, and believe me, of the, of, the, of the population, I'm probably one of the most sedate, laid-back, conservative in that sense, very, uh, uh, but it was a very challenging era. And uh, so when you do go to Dawn's site, you'll see a red book. That's us. <laughs> yeah. Any history of gang activity or inter-neighborhood uh, squabble? Yeah. My uncle, um, who is now 91, lived on Pitt Island. My, par uh, my parents, uh, my, my mother and my uncle and grandparents lived on Pitt Street, which is the street that comes right up in front of school. And my uncle tells many stories at the time. Uh, of the Squirrel Hill kids being chased by the Greenfield guys with bats and chains. Mm -hmm. um, most of the, uh, you know, so as the years have as the years have gone on, uh, Alder Dice is a reflection of the community, yeah. and it's a reflection of society. And so uh, there have been times when there are, you know, gangs between Greenfield and Hazelwood between Squirrel Hill and Greenfield, between East Hills, which uh, East Hills now goes to uh, Westinghouse, uh, for the most part, between East Hills and Hazelwood, uh, East Hills and Homewood. One of the reasons that the students from East Hills stayed at Alderdice is they did not want them to have to go uh, into Homewood because of the gang. Uh, so, yeah. And there are groups, a lot of, a lot of the disruptions, uh, frankly, are based on uh, he, she, uh, 
there was an incident a few weeks ago. And just two students got into it down at the get-go, right in Forward Avenue. And the one student called in all of his buds, and then it was a gang of one student, and the other student then went on social media and uh, threatened that something bad was going to happen, which of course took off um, and unfortunately followed two days later by the student that was uh, killed um, in Homewood, who was a student of ours, who had nothing to do with anything, by the way. He's a lovely gentleman. So, so I think you bring out a good point in the gangs, but also now with social media, there's a lot of personal interaction. This is not specific to Alderdice, but what goes on in the community comes into the building. I will say that this year is, um, frankly, um, yeah, there have been fights. Uh, there have been fights throughout the history of Alder Dice. Nothing new, it's just the players change. But, um, but uh, the school is solid and safe and good. Did I answer your question? Yes. Okay. yes, yes, please. Well, this gentleman has his hand up. I'll go next. Go. What year was the graduating class the highest? I would imagine, I, I can't tell you for sure, but I would imagine it was probably in the early 60s, 50s, 60s, somewhere up 700. Yeah, that would be the highest graduating class. Don't you think that all of those little nuances problems exist in all of the high school? To some degree? Human beings are human beings. It's, so the issues are there, the question is, how do you handle it? 10th graders and 11th graders are like that. And 9th graders are trying to figure out if they're coming or going. Right. Okay. So, yeah. Um, but seriously, they're, they're students. And, and they're human beings, they're students. Um, and the development from grade 9 through senior year um, is remarkable, right. and there are students that leave and don't make it all the way through uh, for a multitude of reasons, but the students that come out will tell you that they are prepared. Yeah. Uh, just to piggyback on the talk about something for everyone, and yes, there, there have been <coughs> turbulent times there. My son went through late 80s, early 90s. He was in a CAS program, and uh, that was back when there was talk about whether the school should close because of some quote-unquote gang violence. No one really knew whether it was gangs or what it was, but uh, the biggest problem they had was keeping the media out so that they could just deal with it on their own. And he would come home and say, it wasn't as big a deal as, as they're reporting. That was in the front of the line that the kid had his ear bitten off. Everything was fine where we were. There was a fight up on the fourth floor. Now I'm down on the third floor, Maine. There was a fight on the fourth floor, and I had no clue, and I didn't know anything was going on until I heard rumbling because kids were running down the steps. But I did hear the Channel 11 helicopter above the building. <laughs> so uh, I got to the point that the principal literally prohibited them from coming on to the school building. Yeah, it was, there was a time if we, you know, look, we're the public school. We're, in, we're, we're Pittsburgh public schools. We're not Mount Lebanon. We're not Upper St. Clair. A lot, we're not Shadyside Academy. And a lot of the same things that happen, um, either they expel the student or they quietly take care of it. In the Pittsburgh public schools, we're, we're in a fishbowl. We always have been. We always will be. Okay. You know, and that's the way it is. But again, repeat, if my student, if my children, uh, who are both uh, uh, more than 10 years old, uh, if, if they were to be back in, I'd have them there right now. Yeah. My high school friend went on to become the undergraduate director of admissions at Columbia University. And in 1980, I was living here in Pittsburgh at that time, and in 1980, he contacted me to say, can I have dinner with you and your wife because I'm in town on a recruiting trip? Mm -hmm. And I said, Jim, what schools are you going to? 
and he said principally Taylor Alderdice hmm. because those kids track in the four years that they're at Columbia at the highest level hmm. because of the multicultural and worldly environment that they come from at Taylor Alderdice. I was very impressed at that since I lived, and he did not know it when he spoke to me, but I told him I lived in the Taylor Alderdice feeder system and that that would be my son's high school. Well, uh, both, of my, both of my own children said, uh, yeah, Alderdice is a microcosm of society, and they learned where to go, where not to go, what to do, what not to do, and they learned a whole series of skills in addition to their academics, um, uh, who, um, uh, how to function in the world. My son's an attorney in Chicago. My daughter's uh, finished a master's in prosthetics and orthotics. You know, and they came. They came, and they both said, "We learned how to function in the world." If I can say one Please. more thing about Alderdice preparation, um, in 19, I graduated from high school in 1967, and in May of 1967, all the seniors went down to the auditorium for the school that I graduated from for uh, award ceremony and honoring graduating seniors. Mm -hmm. And the guidance uh, teachers uh, ran that uh, assembly and were handing out or acknowledging National Merit Scholar <coughs> finalists. Mm -hmm. And I remember to this day, I was not one of them, but I remember to this day her saying, that the only school east of the Mississippi River that had more National Merit Scholar finalists was a school in Pittsburgh, Pennsylvania called Taylor Alderdice. Mm -hmm. Twelve years later, I moved here and again live in the, in the Taylor Alderdice school. We've lost a lot of students um, because people have moved out. Mm -hmm. You know, people have moved to North Allegheny. Money and jobs. The University of North Allegheny. Thank you. I, I didn't say it. I didn't say it. Um, you know, Upper Sink. I had a student who was very, just one of the nicest, sweetest young ladies in the world, and she came in one day and was seething. And, and I had never seen her like this. I mean, she was always very calm, very smiling, and she was very agitated and very seething. I said, What happened? She said, we went to the science, whatever, competition. And beforehand, all the students introduce, you know, hello, my name is, where are you from, what do you do, blah, blah, blah. And, and they said, uh, you know, where are you from? We're from particular, I'm not going to name the high school. It's a suburban school. And we're from that school. And they said, and that student's from that school and said, and where are you from? Oh, we're from Alderdice. And they all went like this. <laughs> and, uh, of course, Alderdice got their revenge because they won. You know? so, <laughs> but, um, look. Again, to be realistic, I'm not going to say that I have never made a mistake with a student, because surely I have. Um, I'm not going to say that everything about Alderdice High School is, you know, hunky-dory and 100%, because that would be unrealistic. What I will say is that it continues to be the anchor of this community. It continues to be the place that students have the opportunity to attend a public school and to go on and to do some really great things in this world if they so desire. And that is the key for understanding Alderdice High School. Okay. Yes? Uh, growing up in the suburbs of Pittsburgh, I was in the service in the early 70s. Mm -hmm. And I believe, while I was away from Pittsburgh in the service, that the fall of the year 73, the teachers were on strike. And it made national news, and they featured Taylor Alderdice School. And I, I was thinking, oh, well, I'm from Pittsburgh. I know where that school is. Yeah, I remember there was a, well, there's a strike in 68. There was another strike in December of 75. 75, yeah. And, uh, yeah, and there was a lot of animosity because teachers were professionals. Teachers were not union members. 
That was the that was the mindset. Teachers were professionals, so it's taken a lot of time to realize the union has really um, has done a lot of good. I mean, pe teachers could get booted for no reason uh, a lot of times. Teachers didn't get paid a lot. A lot of teachers had second jobs, porters, bus drivers, you name it. Um, probably not as bad as what's going on out in, uh, in Oklahoma. I, yeah. Oh my gosh. Um, well, recent you've Howard Feynman, uh, Bernard Fisher, Myron Cope, Myron Copelman. Uh, you know, Curtis Martin, I will tell you, is just an absolute delight and a gentleman. There was another student who was probably a much better football player than Curtis, but you'll never hear his name because he went into oblivion. Mm -hmm. Curtis worked his duff off, was an absolute gentleman. Um, at one point, Alderdice had more professional athletes in the National Football League than any other high school. <laughs> <laughs> it's hilarious. So, yeah. Not to mention the Nobel laureate in chemistry. Oh. Who cut oh, classes. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. And, and, and uh, two uh, very accomplished rap artists, one of whom was a suicide, but you know, and, and from the same school, the yin and yang. And there are lots and lots and lots of graduates who have done magnificent things who we still don't know. Which I have to, I have to right now publicly apologize to everybody here that um, Rika Machero from the uh, Friends of Alderdice put flyers in my mailbox and I ran out of the building and I left them. Please, please, oh my gosh, you're going to kill me. Please. Uh, consider joining the uh, Friends of Alderdice, uh, and um, you can, um, anybody, you have my email, so you can send it on to me, and uh, we will be having the Alderdice uh, Awards uh, for, the, um, for the Alumni Awards uh, probably coming up pretty soon, okay? And again, I publicly apologize for not bringing those to you, but please feel free um, and, and join the group and, uh, and give your input. Yes? I'm curious, how did they decide to name the dragon as one I don't have a clue. <laughs> Which begs also, I have spent hours trying to find out who came up with know something, do something, be something. And I still can't find it. So, any, do you know it? Okay, the dragon was from the Welsh. From Taylor Alderdice. Okay. Does anybody know know something, do something, be something? Yes. Which is the Alderdice motto. <laughs> Ellen, I'm sorry. I'm He's sorry. In the Thank you so much for taking. Me. Well, well, it's very oh, very good. I saw we you. have, um, you back first of all, if you have other questions, feel free to talk to Lena. And also, we ask that since we have to set the chairs up, it would really help if you just take your chairs and pile them up against the wall, and we'll take them from there. So thank you so much for coming. This was a blast from the past. Thank you.